part of the problem is that a lot of companies don't trust online advertising. Partially because of ad blocks. However, there are ways around that. Turn off that pesky ad block. 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 Look at that fine fedora. That is a triboli that tells you entertainment is on its way. When you sit down for a atop the fourth wall video, you know you are guaranteed to see a comic book be lambasted, torn to ribbons. What Doug did for movies and Spoonie did for video games, Lewis does with comic books. And it's his insights and analysis of those comic books, which has helped to grow his subscribers and his view count as the years have gone on. One of the things you're going to start to notice, especially in this episode when you compare it to the last two, is common threads and themes start to emerge between the content creators that are featured heavily on That Guy with the Glasses. One of those major themes we're really going to see play itself out here is always a bridesmaid, never a bride. Or to think of it another way, it's easier to destroy something than it is to create it. In regards to Noah, when given the opportunity to pursue his dream of making a movie, when he was given that financing and that backing by his Patreons, he withdrew into a drunken depression, deciding it was better to retreat into Twitter to roleplay as his dog, rather than attempt to do something new and innovative to chase his own dream. While in Doug's case, he built a website, established a new character, created a brand, and grew an audience before deciding he wanted to branch out and pursue comedy. Sadly, in regards to his dream, his audience was apathetic at best and openly hostile at worst to his pursuit of this goal. Lewis, on the other hand, did the opposite of what Spoonie and Doug did. Rather than establish himself first and then afterwards go on to pursue his goals and his ambitions, he tried to create before he critiqued. And that is perhaps the greatest irony of all, that the man so well known online for tearing apart crappy, terrible comics is himself responsible for creating one of the worst web comics that has ever existed. I'm looking for plot holes. I'm looking for bizarre character motivations. I'm looking for terrible artwork. I'm looking for the bland, the bizarre, the ludicrous, the lazy, the insipid, the surreal. I want to take you on a journey back in time to the mid-2000s to a website created by a young man out in the Midwest. A website created with the sole purpose of hosting his own original content, created in a medium which he felt best expressed his artistic vision. Now I could read you the FAQ that gives you a bit of backstory about what exactly the Lightbringer is about and what happens over its 15 issue run, but I think it would probably be best if we just jumped into a few episodes and really looked at what this world had to offer, because seeing is believing, and you really need to see this to believe it is real. Our story begins in Pharaoh City, a municipality so poor they can't even afford line divisions in their parking lots. It's like a Escher painting, fuck it. We have bigger things to worry about here than the commuters. And within Pharaoh City exists our protagonist doing his day job, which is the typical day job of a character within a superhero comic, running a furniture store. Because hey, everybody needs a Davenport. You're going to want to lay down if you walk around outside. And don't even get me started on trying to find a parking spot. Our main character has a 100% original do not steal background story. His parents were tragically murdered in front of him in an alley at night. I've never heard of that before. That is, that is amazing. I can't believe no other comic book has ever thought to do that as a motivation for why you might become a superhero. Hope business treats you well, Granholm. After all, you gotta pay me back by Friday. You see this nutty bitch? I found her on the street taking shits in people's yards, so I put her in a chain like a dog. I don't know who she is. She's absolutely nut about us. Yes, this dangerous group of thugs that lurks the streets at night, that stick up innocent business owners who are just looking to sell you a decent couch at a reasonable price, go by the name The Slavers. The Slavers. The people walking around with women in chains through the street in broad daylight, holding up small businesses, call themselves The Slavers. And apparently, that's cool with the people in Pharaoh City. It's a, it's a weird place. It's a really weird place to live. But the slavers have made a critical mistake. They've been picking on a crippled man. 
Oh, what's the matter there, Granholm? Your hand is shaking like crazy. I don't I don't even know what's going on. Is that like a tick? Do you have Tourette's syndrome? Did you fuck a microwave? Why is it glowing white like that? That's really weird. That's weirder than the lady that shits in people's lawns. But as it turns out, Granholm doesn't have Tourette's and he didn't fuck a microwave. He actually has hidden superpowers. He can turn light solid and create constructs. Another original idea that nobody has ever done before. I mean, look at him there, dressed in all green, with his glowing hand capable of creating constructs out of solid light. Now, if I were as talented as Linkara, I would have tried to come up with a name that really captured that, but I'm not. You know, he came up with the Lightbringer. I would have gone with, I don't know, combine the color with what it does, a green lantern. You know, but again, I'm not the OC creator here. What the heck do I know? With such amazing superpowers, you can imagine what our protagonist does when he finally realizes he needs to use his powers for good and happens upon a woman being attacked in an alleyway. He runs away. I ran as quickly as I could after I saw it. I was almost hyperventilating as I tried to push the screams for help from my mind. No matter how far I ran, they were always there, scratching at the back of my thoughts and overwhelming my reason and sanity. Damn it! Why do I have to have these abilities? I never wanted them, and I sure as hell can't do anything useful with them. I ran as quickly as I could back to my apartment and gasped for breath during the entire run. My body ached. It wasn't used to the sudden jolts like this, but I knew I had to get off the streets, get away from the screams. But as I ran from the woman and her screams, a new voice entered my mind. The voice was of my mother telling me how one should never fight evil with violence, since it only fueled the evil and made it stronger. So just to sum up to this point, in case you're just joining us right now, in Pharaoh City, there is a man that owns a furniture shop who can create objects out of solid light, and when he comes across a woman being raped in an alleyway, he decides to run home, as the voice of his dead mother tells him to be a pacifist. He doesn't even bother using a cell phone to call the police. He just goes home. Who cares what happens to her? I am the Lightbringer. Throughout the entire run of the Lightbringer, there were many characters that happened to join him in his effort to run away from crimes and not interfere in any way whatsoever. You had people like Ant-Man and Tinfoil Hat Girl, NASCAR driver with a vagina mouth, generic woman holding up a car, generic woman unable to hold up a car, the retarded brother of the Flash, and one quarter man who's missing three-fourths of his body. And let's not forget the feminist slam poet, Code Poet. In between their adventures from actively not trying to stop crime, they occasionally stumble across slaver activity, like the whore market, the actual literal whore market that's held in the heart of Pharaoh's city. And this fresh whore here is ready to serve you in every way you can think of. Look at those tears. She's so happy. It really strains the imagination what exactly the Pharaoh City Police Department does when a group of people calling themselves the Slavers can hold a whore market in the heart of the city. But don't think our protagonist just runs away from criminals. No, he tries to avoid the press as well, though he's not always effective at it. Like that one time a reporter faked her own suicide to get an interview with him, and after which he promptly told her that she was fake news. But perhaps the absolute best thing to happen in this comic book was when Lightbringer fought his doppelganger, the Darkbringer. Because it was during that very encounter that the Lightbringer met one of the most powerful characters in his comic book. I'm talking about Lewis, or as he prefers to be called, Linkara. You know, something about this rings strangely familiar. I just can't quite put my finger on it. When an author inserts themselves in such a way into their own comic book, what does that remind me of? Terrible dialogue, atrocious artwork, empty one-dimensional characters, ridiculous premise and behaviors, and self-insertion in your own fanfic. It's right there. I can almost touch it. But nope, nope. It's just, it's on the tip of my tongue. I can't quite... I can't quite pin it down. Now, the early response to Lightbringer was less than enthusiastic. You could say it was not the positive reception that Linkara was hoping to receive. In fact, if you were to go look at TV tropes, under horrible webcomics, Lightbringer has its very own listing. But it was the ridicule from two particular websites in the very beginning that actually drew a response from Linkara, where he defends his comic 
and talks about the criticisms leveled against it for those from Something Awful, or YWIB. I figured I might as well get this over with, since I've got yet another surge of visitors yesterday from SomethingAwful.com, and the fact that they link my comic with being one of the worst out there, and that pretty soon it's going to be reviewed on Your Webcomic is Bad and You Should Feel Bad About It. I've been wondering whether or not I should do this for a while, mostly because the people who are dead set in their opinions aren't going to be swayed by anything I have to say on the matter, but I figured I might as well try anyway. For those unfamiliar with this, Lightbringer has been posted on SA.com's forums before as an example of one of the worst webcomics out there, and people frequently post about how detestable I am for it, while I'm doing a preemptive strike and responding right here to it. Since I really don't want to shell out $10 to join a forum just to respond to criticism, I'd really wanted to avoid this, since frankly I feel that if someone has a problem with someone else's work, they should just confront them about it and tell them how they feel. So, in a similar vein to what had happened with Christian, something awful had picked up on Lightbringer. They looked at Linkara's work and found it funny. They spread it amongst themselves. And so Linkara, in return, posted this talking about his art and talking about the various problems with it. But I think the absolute best thing in this entire blog post is this one particular paragraph, which is just, it is a gem. It is an absolute treasure that he actually wrote this. When I first came up with her, the idea was, in a nutshell, that she was an actress who was raped on stage in front of thousands of people who didn't realize she was being raped. Apparently, that one particular plot point was enough for something awful to pick up on Lightbringer and to really hone in on Linkara's work. It affected him so much that he actually altered the story to remove it. Stranger still were some of the responses he got from people he actually knew in real life, people he was attending college with. Abby said, Also, in the interest of truthfulness, I was kind of weirded out about how you talk to all of my friends about how I don't like you, even the ones you'd never met before. Totally not a weird thing to do at all. Just go talk to some random girl's friends about why she doesn't like you. Not one bit strange. And that very same year that Something Awful mocked him and a few classmates gave criticisms of what he did or what he created, Lewis took to his forums to talk about a brand new idea he had. That idea being atop the fourth wall. And true to his word, Linkara went about creating atop the fourth wall, though the form it took initially was much different than it is today. He produced upwards of, I believe, 50 of these written comic reviews, even hosting them on a site that he dedicated just to that one purpose, where he would analyze and critique the comic books that he found to be interesting. He was inspired by other people that were doing this by sites that he liked to frequent. It wouldn't be until a year or so later, when he started to watch The Nostalgia Critic, that he decided to switch formats, partly because he was inspired to, and partly because he wanted to enter a contest that that guy with the glasses was holding. Now granted, Linkara's entry video is basically just aping a Nostalgia Critic bit. You could call it an homage if you want to, but it's emulating something he already did, trying to put the Linkara spin on it. And it was one of the first videos that he had ever done. Following that, he would begin to release his Atop the Fourth Wall series as a video format only. After having submitted enough of these, and seeing that there was a viewer interest in the series, he was finally featured on the site and then eventually brought on as a contributor. Now, one thing to note when you're talking about Linkara as opposed to a Spoony one, one stark contrast between the two of them is that Linkara's numbers, unlike Spoonies, aren't going down. They've actually been fairly steady as far as views, subs, and income go. This is in part due to Linkara's ability to have a consistent schedule. He continually puts out videos in the entire time that he's been doing Atop the Fourth Wall. He's put out nearly weekly content. Even more than that, he's put out around 500 videos. So with Noah, the content was sporadic and his numbers suffered because of that. But with Linkara, they've been steady because he consistently puts out the same kind of content week after week after week. But it wasn't just putting out Atop the Fourth Wall videos where he reviewed comic books that drew in viewers. It was also analyzing a certain Saban television show that brought him a lot of attention. Due to the fact that the demand for the show had put such pressure on him that he ended up snapping at viewers who were asking when the next video was going to come. Rocco from Mega64 ended up doing a parody video of it, which is almost, I swear to God, beat for beat, 
dead on. Let me say this once again, since apparently it was not made clear when this video series began. History of Power Rangers has no set schedule. The videos are done when they're done and will be released when they're done. Let me say this once again. History of Voltage Avengers has no set schedule. The videos will be done when they're done. In case you haven't noticed, I've been more than a little busy the last few months. In the rare case you haven't been keeping up with my schedule, I've been more than a little busy the past year. I attended Power Morphicon, Falcon, Anthrocon, the AVNs, HempCon. One of those difficulties being moving into an apartment. This meant getting back in the Kia, having to completely refill my gas tank, having to go to another gas station because my debit card didn't work. Asking me when the next one is going to come is not making it get done any faster. I have warned you all before. Don't ask me for a link when it's up. And it wasn't just people like Rocco mocking or taking shots in Linkara. Others began to as well. Stories started to leak about interactions with him on set and behind the scenes. Now, I've tried my best with the first two videos, and I'll try my best with this one, to keep everything I talk about somewhere within the realm of something that I can actually verify. You may have noticed in the first two videos there was quite a lot of drama that was absent, and that's because it's going to be compiled into the finale. But for these particular videos, I want to at least make sure that what's talked about can be verified in some form or another. And luckily, with at least a few of these, they can be, because Linkara does respond occasionally when people bring them up to him. Now, this account that's actually in this screen cap doesn't exist anymore, but if you go to Linkara's Twitter account, you can see the response is still there. And as he says, not a clue, it's certainly possible I was just in a weird mood and acting weird, but I cannot recall it specifically. And so because of that, I would like to share just a couple of the stories of Linkara that have led to some fairly popular image macros to give you some context and backstory to why those jokes exist in the first place. The following are snippets of interactions that happened while filming with Linkara. They are from people that uh, say that they knew him or worked with him, and these are the interactions that Linkara claims are possible they could have happened, he just doesn't know. At a convention, on break, talking with fellow employees about a girl I liked at the time who also happens to be an employee. Lewis comes up and hovers. He does this a lot. He'll stand by a conversation, but not engage. After a while, he finally chimes in. You know, you shouldn't objectify women like that. I'm not. Then why are you talking about her, hmm? Because she's employed, and I don't know our policy for that. Well, perhaps we need a tighter policy for those of us who would try to object objectify our staff openly. Lewis, chill. Lewis, for fuck's sake. I'm just saying, maybe we shouldn't make the women feel uncomfortable? Maybe we should try to be more enlightened about this. Heading down to the bar, chilling with people down there for a little while, Doug comes down. Look, I'm only coming down because Lewis wants me to. Oh, well, I don't really know. I guess just talk to you. Oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah, look, just stay for his scenes, and if he asks, I yelled at you both, okay? Yep. Walking back up to the room, Linkara is standing outside our fucking door. So, did you learn your lesson? Mm. I start cracking up and had to leave, hear Brad just ripping into him before leaving. I can still hear Lewis outside the door muttering, uncivilized, pathetic, etc, etc. He's butthurt for the next three days. So not only does Linkara acknowledge that these very well could have happened, when you think back to part one with Abby in the comment section of his Lightbringer comics, talking about how Lewis had gone up to her friends that he didn't even know, and talked about her in particular not liking him and how awkward and weird that is, it seems to mesh really well with the kind of stories in his awkward social presentation at gatherings with multiple people. So when you see images like this, and like this, that's where they're coming from. They're actual things that he said and done when he's interacting with other people. In that voice, that that voice that he does, just imagine that. Just imagine him standing outside your door to chastise you because you've gone to have a beer and talk to a girl. Now, perhaps it was because he was always on set so much, filming those videos for the Nostalgia Critic and doing the That Guy With The Glasses anniversary specials. But eventually, Lewis was bitten by the movie bug himself and ended up putting up an Indiegogo campaign to create his very own movie, of which he raised $60,000. He asked for forty. He ended up getting sixty grand to make the Linkara movie. Now, I could try to summarize the entire plot of the film for you, but I, I think it's just easier to give you a general idea of what we're talking about. 
the rating for this movie, for the Atop the Fourth Wall, the Linkara movie, on IMDb right now is a 3.9. Now, to give you some comparison, Catwoman with Halle Berry is rated at a 3.3. So technically, Linkara's movie is a half a point better than Catwoman. That should give you some perspective onto the kind of film that you're watching. And generally, to be honest, what you're going to find is pretty much similar to the anniversary special videos. Granted, filmed on something that wasn't a potato, it's, it's filmed on something that actually looks HD, but still pretty tacky, full of skits, full of secondary characters, a ham-fisted plot. It's your traditional online critic movie. Its speedy arrival is thanks to the development of the Mac fail drive, which drastically increases its speed. Development of the Mac fail drive was made possible thanks to the sale of advanced technology by former President N. Sano, who created the unorthodox method of space travel. I can't believe you idiots actually bought this stuff! They're all the same, they all turn out the same. Now one could look at the Atop the Fourth Wall movie and see that as a, a great success for him. He raised a lot of money, he completed the project on time, and he satisfied the people that were backing him, and everybody seemed pleased with how it turned out in the end. It's... 0.6 points ahead of Catwoman. So he's beating at least one major Hollywood picture. That's that's an accomplishment. But I have to wonder if Linkara had known then what that accomplishment would shine a light on, whether he would have been so gung-ho about going through with it. Because it was through this particular movie that a great deal of Linkara's past was uncovered that stretches well beyond Lightbringer. And it's all thanks to the TV board and a very curious user. Good afternoon, Mr. Linkara. My name is Alan Park. I'm with the United States government. The TV board on 4chan is dedicated towards discussing television and films, and occasionally they'll delve into online content and the creators behind it. One evening a while back, and it was no different really than any other evening, they happened to be discussing an Indiegogo campaign and its successful funding for a movie that an online content creator was going to be making. That content creator was Linkara. The discussion itself was fairly on point, talking about what they thought the film was going to be when it was finished, how much money was going to be dedicated towards it, how good that final product, that end product, was actually going to be. That is, until one person happened to post this. I remember years ago, I found a video on YouTube of Linkara before he became Linkara. It was uploaded in 2005 or 2006. He was as skinny as a rail and his brother was in it. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? I lost the link to the video a long time ago and haven't been able to find it since. A short while later, a response is posted. And from that response, the hunt was on, so to speak. Try to find the video through Google. Find out that Linkara posted in a shemale porn forum back in 2005. Holy shit, Linkara had a thing for women with dicks long before he dated Iron Liz. Once that information was out there, thread after thread after thread was created, all with the purpose of discussing what they could find. And what they uncovered were a multitude of accounts on numerous sites, all linked back to his Lightbringer comic or information posted in relation to that. One such account was this. We're looking at a screen cap of the favorites that were listed in the account profile. I'll read through some of them and you can see if you can figure out exactly what we're discussing. Hermaphrodite. A surprise awaits a bar patron. Necro submission transmitter. He controls his sister, mother, neighbor, and a stranger. Mama's cock chapter eight. 18 year old Wesley finally begins to please his busty mother. But I don't want you to think that this is just confined to the stories posted on this website that Linkara had an interest in. No, he very much enjoyed communicating with the other forum members and discussing his interests in great graphic detail. Online fun with shemales. Hey is all. I'd love to have some online fun with some shemales, herms, etc. My profile gives you a basic idea of what I look like. You can inquire in this thread, over PMs, or in an email. While I'd love to have some real-life fun, sadly, I don't have the convenience of meeting people, and I'm saving myself for my true love, whomever that may be. So reply in any way you can. Enters the room and sits down in a nearby chair. Well... I'm by, and I'll wait my turn either to give or receive. In response to Jenny Jackson's post of, I'm sorry, but unless you're a total nasty slut, you can't apply. Oh yeah? I'm a nasty cock slut, Jenny. I can apply as I wish. Perhaps one of the greatest posts, and one that was screen capped, because immediately after this information began to kind of spread across the internet, Lewis found out, and he immediately shut everything down, closing account after account after account, in a desperate bid to damage control this. Nevertheless, we still have this gem. Teacher gets taught a lesson. 
by Bad Babysitter. Tyrone Lincoln, resident bad boy of the school, an 18-year-old football star, and one of the few black kids in the school. Mr. Popularity. Well, she was tired of his antics, and she was here to make sure he wasn't going to just try to slide by on his football prowess. You stick it in your mouth, you stupid bitch. He grinned and pushed his massive black pole against her lips, moaning softly as he felt his teacher's hands massaging his thick member. He reached down and continued to maul her breast, loving how firm and full they felt behind the blouse. His hands began ripping off the blouse, hoping to fuck her ample cleavage when he was done with her mouth. I love it when you white bitches know what I love. Tyrone laughed as she slid his lengthy black cock between her breasts. He gave a few light pumps between her ample jugs, getting a feel for them as he looked down at his teacher. I'm a little tired from playing with these awesome tits. So you drive for a bit, he said with a grin. He rested his hands at his sides and licked his lips, watching as the teacher who had been trying to punish him was now on her knees and ready to titfuck his big black dick with her huge bust. Of course, his past wasn't just limited to a literotica forum or forums like that. He also had other accounts under that exact same username on sites like Hentai Foundry. Now, sadly, once Lewis found out that this information was out there, he deleted as much as he possibly could. However, there do exist a few tweets talking about the content, which he favorited and liked, right as it was still available before he had a chance to get in there and remove it. Things Linkara jerked off to. Corpses. Feet. Incest. Muppets, gay gangbangs, strap-on beta shit, dick girls, tons of rape. The green M&M. Source, please? Wouldn't be surprised, honestly. Feast your eyes. Not safe for work, obviously. Or anything for that matter. Gay, dead, Muppet gangbang. What the fuck? Now that's a combination of tags that you probably aren't used to seeing listed together in relation to porn. What an incredible way to kill childhood memories. Of course, once the momentum had built up, it just kept going. As fast as Linkara could delete or update profiles to remove the information about himself, people would find even older accounts, like mm.org, which clearly lists his email addresses on the profile so that you know that it's him. And unlike Literotica, on mm.org he had over 7,000 posts, dating all the way back to 2001. Post your damn beauty contest pics, or die. Actually, Oni-chan pulls himself out of a book titled Bylaws Concerning MediaMinor.org Marriage Policies Wearing Library Glasses, according to Article 10 of the Bylaws. A kitty slave is allowed to marry as many partners as she desires, as long as she continues to serve and please each person she marries. So in fact, you're not really cheating on Rinichan. Now everybody, stop worrying about Oni-chan's pics. Or to quote Eric Cartman, I'm gonna kick you in the nuts. Size, stripping circus. Lol, the reason I haven't come in until now is because I just got home from school. Now, any requests on what I'll be wearing before I start my first strip tease? Well, now we're getting sort of off topic, and I don't want Fan to yell at me now, so drags Anata into the brand spankin' new Thread 2 thread and gives Anata advice. Here's the advice. Go to the brand spank new Thread 2 thread and enjoy your newfound bisexuality by spanking both males and females alike. Now, you might be asking, well, is there any conclusive proof that this really was him, that this isn't some elaborate troll? How do we know this is actually Linkara? Well, we happen to know that, because he told us so. This is the cached version of a tweet. The tweet is no longer up, but you can find it on Google. Quick Killer asks, what is this? Linkara responds, actually, you know what? Fuck it. Old porn site. There. Done. Move on with our lives. Now, while Inkara may have deleted his response to that, you can actually click on Quick Killer to see what he was asking about. And what he's asking about is a screen cap of the Ryusu username from Literotica. It's not that easy being green. So how to go about summarizing this? Well, I think the direct approach is probably the best one in this case. Linkara is a prime example of the content creator online who envisions themselves as being able to enter a field they have an interest in and find success there. However, once the reality sets in that they're not up to par, that they don't have the skills or the abilities necessary to be successful within that sphere, they fall back on criticizing the medium they were so in love with. And there are numerous reasons for it. It allows them to stay in touch with the medium they love. It allows them to lash out at the one thing that seemingly led to their rejection. And so we see the creator turned critic. Now again, this is in reverse to what happened to Doug and Noah, who were first established online and then tried to explore their passions and didn't really find the success they were hoping to. Linkara started out trying to find his passion and failing at it, and then going into critiquing things. 
as a fallback from that. And he found success doing it. He was able to establish a name in a series that people know and like and follow and watch. Linkara is also a prime example of why you should always make sure to erase your history, especially when you're younger. The teenage years and the adult years will bite you in the ass later down the road. And if you're not careful, you'll go from being the guy that does really amazing comic book reviews to the guy that wants to get fucked in the ass by a green M&M at a dead gay Muppet gangbang. Hmm? Yeah, it seems Linkara is just full of surprises. Whether it's his, his history of doing really just awful, really horrible webcomics. I can't, I can't really nail that point down strongly enough. They are atrocious. Very, very bad webcomics. The art's all fucked up. It's a self-insert Mary Sue fanfic. The plot makes no sense. The superpowers are ridiculous. The villains are laughable. And it just drags on and on with enormous text blocks. It really is Chris Chan. Honest to God, the only difference is Chris Chan is autistic and Linkara apparently hasn't been diagnosed. Yeah, this, this video came in way shorter than I expected. I, I was looking at about over an hour. I really was. And we're just... We're over 30 minutes. We're about the same length Spoonie was, to be honest, and that's kind of surprising to me. But I think I know one of the reasons for that, at least. Uh, with the finale, with the final video that I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about the majority of the behind-the-scenes stuff. The really salacious rumors. The stuff that I can't necessarily track down a verification for. Or stories that have been told to me uh, by people that were involved with Channel Awesome. And there have been quite a few. And so I'm going to compile that all. And a lot of that revolves around Linkara. Originally, I wasn't planning on doing this, but near the end of the Doug episode, I was like, I could insert a lot of really crazy stories, or I could just leave it stand as it is. Uh, same with Spoonie. You know, it really spoke for itself. So it, it's all going into the finale. Uh, and I'd say a good, a good portion of that, like maybe 15 to 20 minutes, is Linkara-related. Uh, relationships of Linkara. Uh, not just with people he dated, but people who worked at the website and how he got along with them. Uh, up next is the enraged enchilada talking about Pissed Jose. Uh, that should be, that should be fun. As always, thank you for the support on Patreon. Couldn't have uh, made these videos without you guys. Uh, and for the people viewing who aren't Patreon supporters, thanks for watching. Hopefully it was at least somewhat entertaining for you. You got a good, a good 30 minutes out of it and you learn something. You learn something about dead gay Muppet gangbangs.